You know, this morning we're celebrating 20 years in existence as a church. Uh, some of you probably this morning, if you're in here to catch the video, you probably heard some parts of our history that you didn't hear before. Maybe some things you didn't uh, necessarily know before. Uh, I know for me, when I look back, um, and I, you know, I wasn't here for those early days. I wasn't here um, when this church began. But when I look back and I hear stories and I hear the heart of the people who said, man, we should do this thing. And, and I, I think about the ups and the downs and the bruises and the, the bumps, but also the, the victories along the way. Um, there's something about hearing that larger story that goes beyond my tenure here that connects me to something larger. Like there's something about that. I don't know if you feel that. Those of you that saw that, um, I, I don't know if you feel that. Like it's like, man, we're a part of something that is bigger than just like today, bigger than just this moment that we're in. But like there's a larger story of who we are as a church. And this has been going on for a while. And it's kind of cool when you connect that. Um, I also think it's cool when we connect even further than just 20 years back. But when we connect with like the church at large, uh, as we've been moving through this New Testament book called Acts, that's really what we've been doing. We've been looking at the history of the church in this book in the New Testament that outlines. In fact, it begins with this sort of supernaturally infused moment where the church of Jesus really begins in the city of Jerusalem. And then from there, what we've been walking through week after week and chapter after chapter is how the message of Jesus, the story of the, the, the grace of God, really begins to go out from that place into all the regions around, into the world world and how more and more people begin um, to understand this story. That's really what the book of Acts is all about. Now, um, in fact, let me just give you a little insight. This morning, where we're picking up in the story, Acts chapter 12, it's um, good to recognize that this isn't just one event right after another. Even though it seems very linear, uh, it is linear, but there are time gaps. And so, for example, this morning, what we're looking at is roughly 12 years into the life of the church. Um, so we're picking up right where we left off last week, but these incidents that are taking place are happening 12 years after the beginning of the church. So that church is 12 years old, so it's eight years younger than we are as a church, um, which is kind of funny when you think about it that way, right? So 12 years they've been going, and then we come to this story. Now, um, these stories that we're looking at, they're, they're sort of interesting when we consider them. Um, these stories of triumph, these stories of struggle, these stories of faith, these stories of doubt, um, all along the way as we're reading this, my hope is that we're being woven into the fabric of these stories as individuals today and that we're acknowledging our connection almost as a family connection to what's taking place here. And I mentioned that on purpose and let me just explain something. Um, if you in your family history have some sort of epic story that's been passed on for generation, like, like there's people in your family that did something really amazing, really cool, uh, like you know, a couple generations ago, maybe 100 years ago, uh, I jokingly said in the last service, like all of us have known somebody who was related to Daniel Boone, right? Like it doesn't seem like everyone went to school with someone like, oh, I'm related to Daniel Boone or Davy Crocker or whatever. Um, I actually had someone after the last service come up and say, I actually am. And I was like, uh-huh, sure, buddy. Um, <laughs> But you know how you might have this story that's like some epic story of survival and it's somebody in your family, like there's some great grandfather who was lost in the woods and you know, like everything was desperate and they didn't know how they were gonna get out and it was a blizzard and somehow they survived and your family has told this story for generations. If that's you and then you find yourself in a blizzard in the middle of nowhere and you're lost and things are desperate, my guess is that because that's in your family history, you would draw on that for strength, right? You would say, well, first of all, it really sucks this keeps happening to us as a family. But secondly, we have made it before, right? Like we've made it, we've survived, we've done this. And in the same way that they have survived, so shall I, right? You use language like shall I when you're really serious about stuff, right? Like that's like we mean it. I shall not perish, right? I shall be victorious. You change that to you know, shall, it's like suddenly there's weight with that, right? I shall not perish, right? I will live through this. You find strength in your story, in your history. You connect with that sort of thing. When we look at the church, we look at um, what's happening in the book of Acts, it's the same rationale for us, and here's why. There's really beautiful imagery in the New Testament as we read about followers of Jesus and what it meant to really be a Christian then and what it means to be a Christian today. There's this beautiful imagery that um, identifies us with Jesus in a very familial way. What I mean is this, there's language that talks about us being adopted as sons and daughters. Over and over again, the New Testament authors describe you and I as joining a family, being brought into something uh, where we relate to this new group of people as if we are family members. 
That's a repeated theme throughout the New Testament, and what that is reiterating for us is that our family of origin is truly shifted and changed when we become followers of Jesus. Like suddenly the stories of our past go back way further than what we ever imagined because now these stories that we're unpacking are speaking of our history. We're connected to this in a very meaningful, beautiful sort of way. Which means this, as we look at these things, in the same way that a story in your family history that has withstood the test of time and people have told over and over again about you know, the time uncle whoever was stuck in the woods, in the same way that story gets retold for a reason. Which means we come to these texts and we ask the same sort of question. What does it mean that this story is a part of my story or our story? Why is this a story that's been retold and is there any sort of significance to this? Is there something that we draw from these sorts of things? Could, could it be that my story is gonna contain elements that parallel this story? Could it be that the feelings and emotions and uh, the struggles of the people that I read about here are gonna be the same feelings and emotions and struggles that I feel in the present moment now? Could it be that, that there's something more to these stories that attaches to the present reality than what I would first assume? That's what we're understanding. That's what this series is about. It's allowing us to allow these stories to impact our story, which is really great news because um, the one that we're looking at today, the particular um, events that we're gonna be unpacking today have incredible relevance for how we're living our lives in this moment in history. Uh, this is... Um, genuinely um, really good information today. I wouldn't be up here saying this if I didn't believe that it was. This is a story today of very unexpected circumstances and unexpected faith with very unexpected outcomes. If you're taking notes, you want to jot some things down, you want to know what chapter 12 in, in the book of Acts is all about. It is unexpected circumstances with unexpected faith, with unexpected outcomes. That's what we see happening here. So my hope that these things will be woven into our stories as we do this. Um, Acts chapter 12, verse one, we're just gonna start reading and then unpack this story as we move along. This is what it says. Remember, this is 12 years, right? The church has been going for a while. And it says, and about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So first quick point, I've got to look at this and say this story begins with very unexpected circumstances. And, and here's why. Let me explain this. Up until this point, the church had encountered external opposition. They had been threatened from outside forces, but largely those outside forces were the local Jewish religious establishment. That's who had been coming against them. Now, for the very first time, we don't have Jewish religious establishment coming against the church. Now we have the ruling government authorities coming against the church. So this is radically different. In fact, um, just to give you kind of an idea to frame this for you today, this is like the difference between um, campus cops at a college and the Washington State Patrol, <laughs> right? Some of you don't like talking about either of these, but we will for just a moment, right? Let's say that you've done something you shouldn't have done or you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing and you have a choice. You can either be captured and caught by the campus cops or the Washington State Patrol. Which one do you choose? The campus cops, right? Sorry, I know, like there's this moment this morning I had earlier when I realized if you are a campus cop, I'm sorry. I do not mean to demean you or like make you feel bad about your job. We're just really not that afraid of you, right? <laughs> like, I mean, the only thing you can do is keep me from buying books at the bookstore next year. And oh, by the way, I don't go to school there. So, I mean, like, like right? We understand this, right? There's a big difference in authority, in perceived authority, in the impact that person can have on us, right? At least that's my perspective, right? So what we have here in this text is Herod, who is more like the Washington State Patrol than he is like a campus cop. See, the Jewish religious establishment, in order for them to execute somebody or to bring opposition against any group, they would have had to have petition and bring that before the local ruling government. Herod doesn't need to do that. He is the local ruling government. And so he can execute anyone he likes at any moment that he likes, and that's what's happening here. 
He uses his power in this way against the church, and this is brand new. Nobody saw this coming. Like, where did this come from? How in the world could this be happening? In fact, at this point, it's been about 10 or 11 years since the stoning of Stephen that we looked at um, just a few weeks back, this, this incident that really sparked the diaspora of the church, the spreading of the church throughout the Roman Empire. Um, that event was 10 years previous. So there's this huge gap in time in which the church has been growing. It's been thriving. People are, they're, they're, they're changing the culture around them. There's genuine flourishing happen. They've, they've improved the communities that they live in and then out of nowhere, this happens. And James is executed. James. James is one of Jesus' original 12 disciples. So now the church is in the thousands, tens of thousands. And now one of the first 12 that were a part of the whole beginning of this thing is executed. He and his brother John, in the biographies of Jesus, it says they were referred to as the sons of thunder. Like these, these were influential, powerful individuals. And now James unexpectedly has been taken and executed and nobody saw it coming. Just a quick side note, by the way, before we talk about the unexpected nature of this. Um, If you're exploring Christianity uh, or if you find yourself with skeptic tendencies like I do, um, this answers some of the questions I think we frequently think through. Um, If you've ever had moments where you've wondered to yourself, how do we know that this isn't just some religious fabrication by a bunch of delusional individuals meant for some manipulation of some sort? Like, how do we know this story is legitimate? And what we're looking at today, just these moments right here, sort of resolve some of the skepticism that sometimes creeps up even in my, in my own life. James is killed a decade after the resurrection of Jesus, which means it's been 10 years, right? A decade, 10 years, 10 years, right? 10 years of living out the life of, of the gospel of Jesus, 10 years of living in Jerusalem, right? Living in the place that's just blocks, a stone's throw away from the place where Jesus was crucified and buried. Ten years of proclaiming this message, and it's gone on, right? Nobody's refuted this. Like, people haven't come against this. There's nobody that's walked up one day to the tomb and said, hey, can you guys knock this nonsense off? Roll the stone back. There he is. Can you quit with all the stories? Like, that hasn't happened. For ten years, the church has just been growing, and the story's getting bigger, and things are, are, are going on. That alone in itself, the fact that this whole thing has lasted seems to indicate it's not fabricated, right? It's gone on for ten years. It's unprecedented. It would be unprecedented for somebody to live a lie for ten years. It would be absolutely unprecedented for a person to die for that lie after ten years, and yet that's exactly what James does. He dies for this. He dies for this. And that that seems to resolve some of the doubts we might have at times. There's something to consider as we wrestle with this. James is executed. And then, Herod's approval ratings go up. Right? So he starts tweeting. Right? Like, he's all over Twitter. He's just like, Herod rocks, hashtag winning, you know, like... All this stuff, you know, he's like, just like, he starts this promotion. He realizes this was a good move politically. And so what does he do? He has Peter arrested. Hey, if you liked what I did with James, just wait till I do what I do with Peter, right? You thought that was a big deal. So he has Peter arrested, and everybody knows where this thing's headed. Everybody does. The handwriting's on the wall. So imagine the people in the the first church, these people in Jerusalem. They go, there's James, and now there's Peter? I mean, these are Jesus' guys. These are his right-hand people. How does this happen? How could this happen? These are the pillars of the church. It's completely unanticipated and totally unexpected. And I think it's important for us to sit in that unexpected nature for just a moment. This is our story, right? This is our family history. There's a reason this story is being told. And if it's our story, there's something about what's happening here that applies to what's happening here in this room and in our lives right now. And what is that? What does this mean? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It means the unexpected happens, right? Unexpected things happen. And it's not just like unexpected like, oh, I didn't see that coming. Thanks for the great birthday present. It's unexpected like these are things that are not good unexpected, right? Unexpected things happen. In fact, um, whenever I tell somebody my story and, you know, frequently somebody will say, hey, tell me like, tell me about your journey, your story, and I'll end up telling them. And the more I tell people my story, the more I realize how out of control I have been. Anybody ever feel that way? Like, I realize my 
personal story is like this endless string of unexpected events connected together, right? Like, I talk about this, I'm like, well, I was here, and then I was here, and then I was here, and at some point I stop and realize, wow, like, I couldn't have predicted any of this, right? Anybody else feel the same way? Anybody else feeling really anxious right now because you've been living under the illusion that you're in control? <laughs> right, some of you are like, stop it. Stop it right now because you're, you're making me nervous. I like pretending like I'm in control of things, right? But we're not, are we? Like any one of us right now, at any, at any point, we could stop and say, if we were to go back 12 months and tell us about certain things that are going on in our life right now, there are things just 12 months ago we would look at and say, I never would have predicted that. I never would have expected that. Some of those might be good. Some of those might be horrific. But we never would have expected those things. The unexpected is a part of life. We live in an unexpected reality. We cannot predict things. I think that's important for us to own deeply. I think it's one of the reasons why this story is being told because we have to understand this in the depths of our being. There's this misconception about Christianity that, that we have to constantly confront. I think daily there's a misunderstanding about life in Jesus that we need to deal with. Because somehow, somewhere, somebody said that if you follow Jesus, like everything's just gonna be all right, like a Bob Marley song, right? We're just gonna sing it into the sunset. And then somebody took that and said, and by be all right, what we mean is you're going to get everything you want the way you want it and when you want it. Like be all right means things work out according to my expectations, so there's this pervasive idea that following Jesus makes all your dreams come true. All the dreams that culture and Western civilization have planted in our psyche come true in the person of Jesus. Like the best genie you've ever met, right? Like winning a lottery ticket. Like, like if you want a bumper sticker, it'd be like, if you're into winning, you'd love Jesus, that kind of thing. Like, like that's the mentality until the unexpected happens. And when the unexpected happens, we don't know what to do with this, which is why I want to point something out with these individuals, these people that come from our, our origins. They respond in a way that is the polar opposite of how many individuals think about faith. They realize faith doesn't grow when you get what you want. Faith grows in the unexpected, often unwanted circumstances of life when we're being stretched. That's when we grow. Let me say it again, let me say it this way. It's in the unexpected, uncomfortable, and unwanted circumstances of life where our faith frequently grows the most. It's when we're being stretched. Life is one unexpected event after another, but the good news is that God works in the middle of these events. And, and notice how this church responded. Notice how these individuals thought differently about this. In the middle of the unexpected, verse five says, as Peter was kept in prison, they were earnest in prayer for him, right? So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest in prayer for him was made to God by the church. Earnest prayer. This means that the unexpected didn't drive them away from God. It actually drove them to God. Do you see this? Do you see how different it is? Things aren't turning out the way that we expected. Instead of responding with disappointment and frustration and anger towards God and questioning his love or his existence, they're actually driven toward God. There is this unexpected response. They never assumed that one of the outcomes of faith would be a comfortable life. And so it doesn't rattle them. It doesn't rattle them that, that, that outcomes aren't what they expected because that's not what they expected from their faith. Story continues, verse six. Let's read on. It says, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping. By the way, this is a really kind of a comical story in some ways. It says, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter on the side and woke him. And I just love this because it's as if the angel kicked him like while he's sleeping, right? It's like he struck him in the side. I just picture like an angel. I've never pictured this. Just like kicking Peter, like get up, get up. Like, so he's kicking him and he says, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands and the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. 
And he went out and followed him. And he did not know what was being done by the angel, by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision, like he's sleepwalking, right? When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city, and it opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose name was Mark, where many had gathered together and were praying. And by the way, who were they praying for? For Peter, for him, right? So this is what makes this really hilarious. When he knocked on the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda, which translates rosebud, came to answer, recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. Like, you can't make this stuff up. Like, nobody makes this up. Like, she's so excited, she leaves the guest of honor at the gate, right? So she runs inside to tell everybody, hey, you guys, like, Peter's outside. And, like, not even realizing, like, why is he still standing outside? And then I even love this next part, because um, they say to, him, to her, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. Literally, you're, out of, you're crazy. You've lost it. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, well, then it's his angel. Like, he's got to be dead already, and it just must be his ghost. Who knows? But Peter continued knocking. Why? Because they left him outside. <laughs> like, hey, I'm still here. Anybody, right? When they opened it, they saw him, and they were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. I love this, right? And he said, tell these things to James, who's the brother of Jesus, and to the brothers, Then he departed, went to another place. Now when the day came, there was no little disturbance, which means there was a very large disturbance, among the soldiers of what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now, here's what I love about this story. The humor aside, this is what I love about this. I love the honesty of it. I love the transparency, the genuineness of this. I love, first of all, I mean, obviously, I love that these people, they encounter unexpected circumstances and they pray, right? Their response is not to run away from God, but to run to God, right? Peter is arrested and they pray. But I also love that the story reveals that they went to prayer feeling the way that I often feel and that maybe you feel at times, right? Right? Something happens in our lives and we go, man, we should pray about this thing. And so we pray. We should pray, right? Like we just all agree, like I should pray, we should pray, you should pray. People say, I'm praying for you about this. Man, we should pray about this. But how many times in the middle of the unexpected, in the middle of circumstances you never would have predicted, are you saying we should pray, but there's a part of you that says, but why does it even matter? Like, will it even make a difference? Does prayer actually like somehow change an unchangeable God? Like explain this to me. Like we start, like I don't know if, if you're like me, I get really philosophical with prayer. Like should I, like am I praying to change my heart or praying to change God's heart? Like why do I pray? I start asking all of these sorts of questions, right? Will it even matter? Will it even make a difference? Peter shows up at the door and then the people when they hear about this, they say there's no way that God answered our prayers. Do you realize the irony of this? You're crazy. I know we've been praying about it for hours, like on end, but there's no way that God answers our prayers. That's essentially what's happening here, right? There's no way that it's Peter. And she's like, no, trust me, it is Peter, right? Like the story includes these details of Peter's deliverance. I kind of go, why all these details about being led out through all these things? I truly believe this story is being given to us in this fashion to point out that this can't be ascribed to some coincidence. This can't be described as some sort of natural disaster that took place, like an earthquake, and so Peter happened to get out and we called it God. Well, the events are described in great, teal, de- great detail, I believe, so that the people would understand that they had prayed and God seemingly responded to their prayers. This isn't random this is God working and yet they're shocked does this strike anybody else besides me as a little bit unusual right they pray for something but when it happens they don't believe it why could it be because they've prayed for things before and they were disappointed could it be that they've prayed for things before and things didn't work out the way they expected 
Could it be they've asked? Could it be that, that maybe even they prayed for James the week or two weeks previous when he was captured? Could it be that Peter had even joined with them and prayed with them? Peter, the rock of the church, and Peter's prayers weren't answered. And if Peter's prayers weren't answered, how in the world could we expect our prayers to be answered? Could it be that the lack of God fulfilling their expectations in the past led them to wonder whether he would in this moment? I don't know what's going on. I don't know the the history of this. All I know is that when they have their prayers answered, they're surprised by this, right? Like, oh, God actually answered our prayer this time, right? Which tells me that they were praying, but not praying maybe the same way or from the same heart that I pray. And there's a faith that seems to be exhibited here that is somewhat unexpected, isn't it? Let me just say it this way. It is one thing for you and I to have faith when things go our way. It's one thing um, to believe when we get what we want, but these people were forced to believe God apart from their outcomes. And we learned something. We learned that unexpected faith believes God for who he is apart from what he does. And there's a distinction in this. For these individuals, they were pressed into faith, but there was this healthy detachment from outcomes. And I know that might be overly simplistic for some of you. I know some of you go, I, listen, I, that's hard for me to swallow. I get that. I understand that. But that's what's being shown to us. Now, does this mean that we don't pray, pray with expectation? It, it doesn't mean that. Does it mean that we don't ask for particular outcomes? That's not what this is saying. But it does say this, that our trust will remain the same in God regardless of the outcomes. And the example of our trust will be when you and I return to God in prayer even when he hasn't answered the way we expected in the past. That's where our faith and our trust is exhibited. That's what this is showing us. Probably showing some of you, my my guess is that some of you right now have some unexpected circumstances and some unpredictable things that are going on. And there's probably a side of you that's saying, is it even worth it to pray? Like, do I even bother doing this? My guess is you're hesitant to take these things to God. And yet, even in your hesitancy, that's the example that's given to us. Pray. Seek God for these things. Bring them to him. I love the honesty of this. I love the transparency of this. I love that people of faith are people who go to God trusting him in this mixture of doubt and skepticism And yet they're surprised when he answered, pleasantly surprised when he answers. So there's these unexpected circumstances. There's this unexpected faith. And then we have incredibly unexpected outcomes that I think change our entire perspective of how we view ourselves in the world. I want you just to see what happens next. That was a really big sentence, by the way. Changes how we view ourselves in the world. But this next thing does this. Verse 20 says, Now Herod... He's down in Caesarea now. He was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes. He took his seat on the throne and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And then a great little detail here, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. (laughs) And then there's this capstone. Verse 24 says, but the word of God increased and multiplied. If you've been here through this series, that phrase, but the word of God increased and multiplied, it's been repeated over and over and over again. Every time there's opposition, whatever opposition there was, and whatever story we've read, it ends with this, but the word of God increased and multiplied. And there is a much larger application here and an outcome that is completely unexpected that I think shifts our worldview. Um, By the way, if you thought the people were surprised when Peter was knocking at the door, imagine their surprise when somebody showed up and said, hey, Herod basically exploded and was full of worms and he's gone, right? Um, In fact, the historian Josephus, uh, who wasn't a Christian, he was a Jewish historian, he actually recorded this event in his history, and it's unbelievable. Like, he confirms this, that Herod literally just, like, imploded. Like, it was just crazy, full of worms, that this crazy thing that happened. So he's gone. But in this moment, when Herod is gone, 
if you pause for just a moment, it's as if suddenly our view of the story goes from this like ground level view. It's like we get lifted up to several thousand feet and suddenly we see the narrative arc of the church and what Jesus is accomplishing in the world completely differently you realize there's something larger at play here. There's more than just a temporary moment of tension being resolved. Now, I'm not saying that the moment that they're in doesn't matter, and I'm not saying that the individual moments that we are in don't matter. I think those things are very important. But this moment is not all that there is. Just think about what's happening here. Think about what's taking place in our little family history If you're a Jesus follower, this is your family history. And I want you to think about what's happening in your family history. The church is persecuted by the religious establishment and the church prevails. The church is persecuted by the Roman political establishment and the church prevails. And as you read on in the book of Acts and as you read on in human history, There is religious persecution and there is political persecution, opposition against the church over and over again for century after century after century and the church prevails. The church prevails. And what's unexpected out of this as you begin to lift yourself out of the circumstances and begin to to see this from this more grand view, the unexpected outcome is that we begin to realize we are not a part of some religious establishment or political establishment, but we are included and woven in to this larger story that is continually prevailing. It means our very identity is different because of this. This is our family history. This is our story. We've been woven into this, which means who we are is now shaped by this. How we identify ourselves is now formed by this. This has implications on how we live. This has implications on how we move within an existing political system around us, amidst existing religious systems around us. It it means it has impact on the posture that we maintain navigating cultural events, the way in which we walk through our individual days. All of these things are shaped by this larger reality that the gospel prevails. There's a bigger story here. I've struggled, I'll just share this. I, I, I don't talk about this stuff very often, but on a very personal level, I have been struggling a lot lately with the climate in our culture, in our society today. The political, religious, um, societal pressures, the, the, the culture around us, the climate is toxic. Um, in fact, it's hard for some of you to maybe believe this. I literally have found myself speechless. That's a joke about this. Um, Legitimately, I mean, I'm just looking on what's going on and just whether it's social media or the news or wherever, I just look and I'm just like, I don't even know what to say. Like, I just, I, I feel this, this confusion and this anxiety. I feel this hollowness and this ache in my soul. And I, I find myself asking questions like, where do I fit in all of this? Where do I fit in all the the fighting that's going on, the sides that are being taken? And, and what do I say to all of this? And should I say something to all of this? And should I take a side in this? This, this is an incredibly polarizing period of history right now and I find myself struggling to fit in. Like, where do I fit into this? Because the constructs and the labels and the way that we identify one another in our culture today don't seem to fit me. Just can't seem to wear any of them, and none of them seem to fit right. But when I consider my history, and I see that my story isn't connected to the political story of the present or the religious story of some other reality, when I realize that this story that we're reading is my story, there's something amazing and beautiful and powerful that happens. I am lifted out of these events and given an entirely new perspective and even roll in the middle of the mess. The outcome is unexpected and it's this. It's the unexpected outcome is that we are unpredictable people because of the gospel. We are unpredictable because Jesus causes us to be so conservative at times that liberal people don't know what to do with us and so liberal at times that conservatives don't know what to do with us. The message of Jesus changes us. We, we become full of faith. We become not defined by religious or political establishment, but by the life and the message of Jesus himself. That's what defines us. That's the only label that fits. 
And that just changes us completely. It makes us a, a new kind of people, a new humanity. In the middle of all this wrestling, like I said, I've been speechless. And yesterday, um, Sherry and I were sitting, we were uh, working through some marriage material, some stuff that we're going to talk about in the days ahead here at Summit. And at the end of this one thing that we were watching, um, somebody read this quote. And as I read this quote, it was like one of those moments. It was like, that's it. Like, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what it looks like to live this out. And so this morning, I want to close by sharing with you the words of St. Francis of Assisi. He said this. He said, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Let me bring flourishing to the people around me. What does that look like? I love his expression. He says, where there is hatred, let me so love. And where there is injury, let me pardon. And where there is doubt, let me bring faith. And where there is despair, let me bring hope. And where there is sadness, let me bring joy. And where there is darkness, let me bring light. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to understand as to understand, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Let me just say this. The church prevails The message of Jesus prevails and you and I are a part of a story, a narrative that is bigger and more profound and more powerful than any of the chaos that's happening around us. There is another way to live. In the middle of the unexpected, there is a faith that we can lean into and there is a people that we can become that is beautiful. And may it be said of us that the word of God multiplied and expanded greatly because of who we are. Amen? Would you stand with me? We're going to close this morning by singing uh, something that I think connects us very deeply to our history. Let's close by singing together. As I've talked today, if there's anything that um, you've just like stirred up inside of you and you want to talk to somebody, there's some folks that'll be around down front, like give you some coaching, give you some advice, even pray with you um, because that seems to do something. Um, So I just invite you to do that. But as you go today, may you be the church that Jesus dreamt you would be. May you be men and women who have an unexpected faith amidst unexpected circumstances and may the outcome of your life be a fresh, beautiful gift to the people who live around you. Amen? Amen. Have an amazing day. Love you guys. And we'll see you next Sunday. Rich Stearns from World Visions with us next week. So it should be a great day. We'll see you guys here next week.